Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the behaviour-based UX research partner for enterprise leaders who need an independent perspective to align hearts and minds, and also the home of New Zealand's first and only world-class human-centred research and innovation lab. If that sounds interesting, you can find out more about what we do at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management, and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is Jane Portman. Jane is the co-founder of UserList, an email marketing and in-app messaging platform that's built with B2B SaaS in mind, enabling companies to onboard, engage, and nurture customers and leads. Before UserList, Jane was the founder of Tiny Reminder, a SaaS product that helps busy creatives and consultants to send automated notifications to their clients about the things that they need from them. Jane's also the founder of UI Breakfast, one of the world's longest running and most successful design podcasts. The show has now been on air since 2014 and boasts over 260 conversations with a wide range of industry experts. Given Jane's talent and track record as a podcaster, it's no surprise that she hosts another podcast. This one's called Better Done Than Perfect, and it explores email automation, marketing, content, and product strategy for founders and product people. A voracious content producer, Jane is also the author of several design books, including Mastering App Presentation, which is a self-published guide for pitching design work, Fundamental UI Design, which was translated into a course in conjunction with Envision, and the UI Audit, a hands-on guide to web app design. And now, Jane's here with me for this conversation on Brave UX. Jane, hello, and a very warm welcome to the show. Hi, Brandon. Uh, You have such a detailed inventory of the things that uh, I made, even the not successful ones. It's almost on the verge of like flattering and embarrassing. That's so nice of you. Thanks. <laughs> You're most welcome, Jane. And you made it very easy for me by painting such a clear picture through the things that you've produced on your blog, uh, through your podcast and all the other things that I was able to look at before today. Now, I sometimes start these podcasts on a curious note. So we'll just see how we go with this uh, this first question. And that is that I understand that Jane Portman isn't your real name, is it? Well, that's a very spicy question. That's an interesting fact. In fact, if I had known that Jane Porter is uh, Tarzan's girlfriend, I would have never picked that name. But I only <laughs> learned that a few years afterwards. I come from a country in Eastern Europe that should not be named these days. And uh, back from the old days an exchange student i just knew our names don't work it just comes up as too big of a barrier between between other people and ourselves in the conversations so when i started out as a solo consultant in the international scene i just had to pick a name jane is a short name that's very close to my original one and the last name i completely made up I also had a pragmatic reason in mind uh, because I was on maternity leave with my first baby. At that time, I was a creative director in an agency, and I did not want my director to figure out that I was doing something on the side while I was taking maternity leave in their company. So it's like uh, two reasons why that happened. Do you find it strange that I assume anyway that People that know you, even people that don't really know you, as in, you know, we've just met, call you a name that your mother didn't give you or that your mum and dad didn't give you? It's completely part of my personality at this stage. Mm. So it's totally fine. Uh, There was uh, a certain embarrassment when I had to sign bills or papers with my legal name and I had Mm. to give an explainer like what that is. But with years that kind of faded out and these days I just stay that matter of fact and uh, it seems that the more confident you are, the less everybody cares. So, Well, speaking of confidence, that's something that from the outside looking in, that's something that you really possess. And I'm always curious as to how people 
have become confident? What are the things that have made them who they are today? And one of the things that I discovered when I was preparing for this conversation was a blog post on your website, which I think was from 2017, which is the year that you turned 30. And you wrote this reflective post where you outlined some of the bigger milestones in your life and the things that you felt had helped to shape who you were at that time. And I I, I noticed in that post that you'd mentioned that you were raised by your mum uh, on her own alongside your younger brother. And having spoken to you before the show, I understand that it was a loving but perhaps not quite a lavish upbringing. So when you think of your childhood growing up in Vronage, What's the most powerful memory for you that comes to mind? It's it's really hard to pick just one. I was uh, kind of a kid that was great at school, but didn't have fancy clothes or anything else that can boost a child's confidence in life. And also, as I as I learned these days, now having the ability to to buy ni- nice looking things and stuff, I do love it when things look good as a designer, as an aesthetic person. And throughout my childhood, everything was like a design embarrassment. So my whole life journey is from being not able to make everything look uh, nice and uh, perfect to, to getting there in terms of things looking nice, basically. I think that's an that's important part of our life to be able to just surround ourselves with the things we like. And I'm not talking fancy brands. I'm just talking about, you know, building a nice life around yourself. There are many kids that are deprived of that. So, I understand that your mother was particularly invested in the education of both you and your brother. And I wouldn't say force, that's probably not the right word, that's not conveying the intention that I'm trying to convey here, but um, really encouraged you to extend yourself past just the regular things that you were learning at school. Just what influence do you feel that her guidance in that direction has had on the opportunities that you've been able to create for yourself since you've been an adult? We've always been uh, on the like extracurricular level of like sciences and stuff. Uh, so she's a mathematician and a, a programming engineer by trade as a programming as it was in like in, in the old years uh, when mm-hmm. With the punch cards. periphery, with the punch cards and stuff, yeah, yeah that yeah, kind yeah. of, but that still implies some in, like mathematic thinking. So, and we did follow her footsteps, being programmers ourselves, uh, by um, going to university. So, we were always like solving interesting puzzles, and it was always more interesting than like a boring chore. And I have no idea how that came to be, either through our natural curiosity and. Uh, desire to learn or by some uh, specific things that she did however like that was an academically uh, warm environment in our house so we didn't do much in terms of sports not much but we definitely did uh, lots of reading lots of maths and that was math and physics kind of uh, kind of got a lot but also thankful that she took me to english classes it was three times a week there was a lot of time invested and uh, it did pay off so very grateful for that those English classes, maybe this dovetails into something else that you mentioned when we first started speaking, which was the exchange program that took you to South Carolina and the in the United States, right? So reflecting on that time, because I understand this is when you were around about sixteen or seventeen. Yeah. What do you remember as as a as a young person from Eastern Europe arriving in the US as the most uh, challenging cultural difference that you had to navigate? It wasn't the cultural difference, but it was the language. Um, I could write perfect academic English, but well, the perfect, but definitely nice. Uh, and I was really strong academically, but I could not make anything that people were saying with a Southern accent and everything in mind. I arrived to school and my host mom, she had been hosting exchange students for ages before she had me. So uh, her English was very well like adjusted for uh, international people but at school not too many people were that like clearly talking like (laughs) basically somebody would ask me like what's your name and in my home English like we were taught that it's supposed to sound like what is your name which is never effect in real life 
and and other things like that. So I somehow struggled through the first four months. And then by New Year, approximately, I started making sense of what's happening around. And also mm, just the context of what's happening in high school, like all the cliques and tables and where everybody sits in, in, in the break. And I joined a clique of... Uh, like indie rock art folks who were sitting on the floor instead of sitting at the tables with other groups. Uh, and that was fun. And we also had art classes there, which I think uh, kind of gave birth to the design as, as a profession because they did accept CGI. Uh, so I played with Photoshop a lot. And that's after coming back, became, became my sort of uh, first a side job and then a profession. Yeah, and I understand that the first time you actually had a computer in the home was on this exchange year that mm -hmm, you had. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like it was quite a pivotal moment for you in terms of how you would eventually uh, end up working in design and going on to do the things that you've done. I, before we get into design, because I really do want to get into a few things around design, including the business of design and your journey as a founder. But before we dig into that, I learned that one of the side gigs you did when you were at university was as a, a, a live interpreter for business negotiations. And to me, that sounded really fascinating. And I was curious, was it really fascinating or, or was it just sort of humdrum boring? Like, did anything exciting happen while you were, you know, interpreting these conversations between people that can't actually directly understand each other? Among other side gigs, uh, this was the uh, least voluminous one. So I basically did one or two times and that's it. Uh, the, the way I went about it, I placed um, like a Yellow Pages ad that I can be a tutor of English, uh, which I did consistently. And also an interpreter. And somebody reached out and I actually got to translate a few days of that, which was interpret, which was, I imagine, completely unprofessional, but also like I, I, I did get the job done. Yeah, it was a nice, uh, refreshing experience. Uh, my English skills and, and language skills were enough to, to interpret what's, what's been going on. But there was, uh, it was a Spanish delegation and there was an interpreter on the other side and she was like, Jane, I can tell you're not a professional interpreter. You're just putting <laughs> too much of yourself in this. Uh, when you interpret, you should say, they say that and so on. And I was just <laughs> behaving as I'm the part of this group, which I shouldn't be. Like, I should be more neutral. These days, if I were to interpret again, I would act more neutral. Fascinating. It's really fascinating. So you were working at an agency, right? This is part of your story uh, around about the time that you had your first child. And you mentioned at that at that time you wanted to do something different. And that's where the name Jane Portman came from. And um, also around this time, uh, you've touched on this before and other things you've said that you were kind of a bit burned out or tired with the prospect of managing other people. So you founded UI Breakfast, which was your freelance consulting uh, agency, and you did that for a number of years. And as I mentioned earlier on in your introduction, you also you did a number of things during these years when you were a consulting designer. You published a number of books, you, co uh, you created that course with Envision, um, and you certainly put yourself out there with the UI Breakfast podcast, which has been phenomenally successful. It seems to me that you like to experiment with your career. How do you look at it? How do you look at your career? Do you feel like you're intentionally experimenting or is, is this just something that's just happened and it's just been it's just been good fortune the way things have unfolded? Uh, it's definitely a lot of uh, experimentation and just planned well uh, well ensured business experiments so you always i think it's called uh, the uh, barbell strategy one of my favorite books the anti fragile book by nasim taleb so he calls it a barbell strategy you can't advance in life without taking significant risks but your basis should be always covered so you protect your like you ha always have that plan B or like your core core way of making money while you can experiment with other things. And that's what I've been doing in different ways. Uh, so on one side, basically when, when I was that little girl in the middle of nowhere uh, on the maternity leave, completely no friends, no idea how to make money online, but I did have good English and I did have great design chops by then. So I was sure about that. I was um, specializing in uh, mobile design back then was the big thing. So I thought I can figure it out. Uh, I did a bit of Googling, came across uh, Upwork, Odesk back then. So I had 
my first few gigs at like $16 per hour back there, uh, I actually have a letter to my employee back then saying, not employee, like client saying, oh, I'm very sorry. I have to raise my rates from $16 to $25 an hour because that's how much I'm worth. Like, I'm very sorry if that's too much and things like that. So I went through a range of clients raising my rates. I hit the ceiling somewhere about $50 per hour was just, just a bit too much. I was also doing a lot of reading about marketing and consulting and uh, a life-changing piece by Patrick McKenzie about how I turn from a hundred dollar an hour developer to five thousand dollar a week consultant basically you're doing the same things but calling yourself a different name and making it about business not about your skills from then on i said no more gigs from upwork i'm gonna write a book call myself a consultant hike my rakes and uh, just go from there and a bit of hustling I did write that first book, which didn't go anywhere, made no money, but I was like a foundation for building my email list and stuff. And just took it from there through a series of experiments, more books, more uh, collaborations. Yeah, sure. Luck did uh, strike a few times. For example, that collaboration with Envision was uh, definitely a great find for me back then because they gave me a number of emails that was like the first few thousand in my email list, not the first few, but like a big part of my email list was uh, through that collaboration. I also stumbled across a few awesome clients who amplified what I was doing. Also was uh, lucky enough to ride the wave of productized consulting with my gig so that it became known not only for the design itself, but for the fact that it was in the format of productized consulting. So it was featured in a couple well-amplified blog posts about productized consulting. And then actually the fourth book that you didn't mention was about productized consulting. Um, between all the four books, I think that one still holds business value and it's still... Uh, oh, still... It's the one I missed. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was written the last, it was, uh, I think, maybe 2017 that was done. Your productized consulting guide. So there were many good events that were a stroke of luck, but that would never be possible if the foundation for that were not done with hard <laughs> labor. <laughs> well, let's sense. talk about something that has to do with hard labor. And that is the role of UI Breakfast, the podcast. Where did that come from? Uh, you're saying it was wildly successful. It wasn't wildly successful for the first five years, for sure. Um, mm. It's been now out for nine years. Mm -hmm. So the first few were just completely erratic schedule. I started it with the intention of getting more comfortable in front of the mic. That the, was the only purpose. And I just experimented with this, had fun, had the very, very cheap uh, editing service for the audio and just observed. And I made it a more regular publishing schedule for another few years. Things started ramping up and it took like, seven years to get to the first million of total downloads, then another year and a half to get to 2 million total downloads. And we're like approaching three or maybe have already crossed 3 million at this moment. It's just incredible how this builds up over time. Somewhere in the middle of the journey, maybe five years in, maybe four years in, I started accepting sponsorships, which was a nice, nice cash addition to the whole thing. And then in another year or two, I delegated production to a dedicated person, which that person has changed over years. These days, it's Chris, our team members at, at Uselist. But the being able to put it on uh, like as a background process done by somebody else so that I can show up, do the recording, upload my scribble notes, and then everything else is handled, that makes it possible to run two shows and have a full-time founder job at this particular moment. As a busy founder, every now and then, every few months, I kind of audit what's on my plate. And we're like, oh, podcasting, like, shall we like take a break or shall we not? But it's always, it's always learning and uh, making friends and it's like scheduled learning for me. So I don't listen to other podcasts these days. I don't have uh, time and I prefer audiobooks, but like one or two times a week, I sit down with a very interesting person and get to pick their brain. And uh, serendipitously, there is always a timely insight for my own business situation. Uh, like a nugget of something I can apply. And it's definitely fun and it's definitely useful to listeners. So we, we always choose to keep this flywheel going on. 
That is really great that you've outlined that. That was actually something I was going to ask you about because I've heard you talk about this before, about the the role of UI Breakfast and how it has related to the su- success of UserList. And it's not quite what people might think. And so I'll quote you now. You've said, I have an audience of my own, and so you're talking about um, UI Breakfast here, related to design, and I'm sure there are plenty of founders in that audience, and I've learned that personal audiences don't translate into SaaS sales, period. So what you were saying there about the applicability of some of the insights from the conversations that you have with people once or twice a week having um, an, a direct impact in your business. That sounds to me, at least, as to the reason to why you keep producing this podcast on a weekly basis, because it's clearly it's not a, it's not a, an effort that um, that doesn't happen without a lot of effort. Yes, having a personal audience and having a business audience and just it doesn't work from one another. It's like you you, you do. Parlays, I think the word is parlay, right? From a sort of segue from being influential in one place towards building something successful because you know you're capable of that. I think that's the most important influence of it. But in the way of translating like leads from one place to another, at least in the business uh, we're in, the B2B hardcore email automation business, it does not translate like that. And more uh, importantly, just generally making sales in user list is a hard process because it's a very long-term uh, game. It's a very long sales cycle. There is only once in five years or so, like once every three, five years, the business changes their email platform. And that's when we need to be on top of their mind. We can't just cold email people and say, oh, just come switch your email platforms, right? Like come to us. And they're like, sure, I like you, but well, not in another few years that we are planning to implement that. By the way, that we only learned a few years in, like we somehow were uh, more delusional when we started, which I'm great, grateful we did. Because if we did know about the hardships of selling email software and how competitive the space is and how many hardships there are, we would never have started. And now we have. <laughs> so hindsight's a wonderful thing, but it's also a wonderful thing not to have before, yes. as in foresight, because otherwise yes. we probably wouldn't do many of the things that we, we do yeah. do. Uh, between user list and consulting, there was another first product that you mentioned so proudly, a uh, tiny reminder tool, which only existed for a year. It was a great learning experience. I sold it for a small amount of money to a fellow founder that took it uh, as like a satellite to, to their business. That's when I learned a lot of things that selling software is hard, that you need to be solving a very burning business problem and being close to the money versus being like a vitamin, uh, which is not necessarily always true, but that's what I learned back then. And that your personal audience does not guarantee you sales. Like this is this completely different story. And a book, an info product is an impulse buy. You can sell that with your eyes closed, people will buy it because they like you. They only, the only thing they have to do is to make the payment and put it on their bookshelf, maybe read in a good way, but you're not really tied any further with software. You really have to be bringing value continuously. And that is a much, much tighter match, uh, in terms of value and the audience and the pain and everything. It's just a, such a different story. You mentioned that you learned with tiny reminder that you needed to be much closer to the money. I think the, the words you mm-hmm, used and not mm-hmm. be a vitamin. So for people like, like myself who aren't really that familiar with the underlying meaning there, what do you mean? Like, what is the thing that, why, why do you not want to be a vitamin type product? These days, I'm kind of back to thinking that vitamin products also have their, their place in the universe. For example, a fellow product, Churnkey, that's uh, their founder is one of our angel investors. They target the same exact audience of SaaS businesses at a similar scale, but they have a much easier time making their sale because they don't have to replace an existing important piece of infrastructure, an existing piece of infrastructure, but they can be just added onto the existing system uh, for preventing churn. And uh, even though the installation does take effort and time, it's still easier to add something versus replacing the core piece. And we represent the core piece. Um, The beauty of that is, of course, that once we're in, 
this kind of resistance is on our side and uh, we have much higher retention and things like that. So that's a positive note. But if, but, but, but the, but the friction of getting started and replacing something important is, uh, is a different story. But overall, there are tools that are kind of like nice productivity, nice to have things. And there are tools that are like payment providers, payment processors, some hardcore business stuff that is like your vertical line of important tools that your business runs on. We want it to be that kind of tool, not an add-on. I've heard you describe how you never had any doubts that UserList was a product that people needed, yet the slow, slowness of the growth in terms of monthly recurring revenue, which is essentially the adoption of the product by the marketplace, surprised you and that at times it's felt like, and I'll quote you now, like a marketing drudge. So there's obviously challenges in, in all businesses and, and clearly you've touched on there uh, perhaps more significant challenges in a product-based business than there are than there is in a consulting-based business or in an info product-based business. How have you grown within yourself as a professional as a result of sticking with UserList and riding these, these highs and these lows? Yeah, so I think you've uh, you've read the update uh, from like 17, uh, 2017, 18. We're really the dark years because what I described just now of, of adoption friction and everything that was obviously still valid then, we just didn't know that very specifically yet. Um, that multiplied by the fact that we were a very young startup with no credibility and people do not want to have young startups if they're, if they're like core infrastructure in the business. Uh, so, and that multiplied by the fact that the product itself was in fact very young and uh, featured deficient in some spots. It was very decent, but there were some things missing that are uh, sort of the normal for uh, email service providers. And it's, it's, it's a very feature rich business. So it took us a few years to catch up right now. I think we're, we've done catching up most sense. And that's really very nice to know because we can sell this more confidently that, but uh, multiplied by the fact that, oh, we have more credibility now. So that curve is like happening smoother. And throughout the last couple of years, uh, we've gotten much better at email automation itself. So the last two years, all we've, I've been doing is talking about email marketing strategy and how the actual implementation mechanics work. Because there is a very big gap in the market. Marketers, even email marketers, they know what they want to say in the emails. They know how to write the emails. But the campaign mechanics, how to orchestrate that, how to link that to behavior data and how to set things up so that they trigger at the right time. There is basically a few people in the world who are good at that. And these are specifically email automation consultants. And a typical marketer at a SaaS company, who is our ideal client, it's not, they're not an email automation consultant. They're just a marketing person. They're great at marketing. But they are not great at email uh, automation. So we have to bridge that somehow. So right now, it's really three viable options for them are to hire that automation consultant or to get our own done for you services, which we added this year, or to just work with very, very close with us using all the planning materials and everything we've got. Uh, so that it's a successful implementation. It's not a thing you can wing. So just putting that in the brain of, of our audience and just working from that standpoint, uh, it's something that we have learned uh, and that we have, uh, you know, we're still in the journey of uh, making the best of what we know there. And uh, that's on the like product knowledge, audience knowledge side. And one more thing that I've really grown in the direction of is uh, content marketing. Uh, we started working on SEO two years ago, uh, covered the foundational piece with the help of a consultant. And then we've slowly drifted from just having content for SEO toward, and, and that ranking towards having really awesome content for SEO. And then these days we're writing pieces that are not n even necessarily uh, SEO pieces, but more for thought leadership. So we are publishing less, but this is like really amazing stuff. And uh, 
our blog is something I'm very proud of that we've built over the years. That was not in place in those dark times. Uh, so right now, content marketing is our source of leads. Those days, we didn't yet know that it would be. And you should know that SEO for email marketing automation is a very competitive space. Thankfully, we have a privilege of niching down for SaaS. So basically adding anything and a label of SaaS in the end kind of helps with SEO. Uh, because it's more narrow, but it's still a drudge, uh, not not a drudge, but like it's still a very slow, painstaking journey. That would be the right word. <laughs> well, let's touch on that because you've talked about the time, the timing, the role of timing in people's decision making when it comes to switching infrastructure products of mm -hmm. which UserList is and that how initially that didn't align with how you thought things would play out, as in you felt that the market was going to respond more quickly than perhaps it has. But the things that you've been describing to me there, there, there are a lot of long-term plays, you know, in terms of the podcasting, in terms of the blog content, in terms of just sticking with something through those dark times, as you've called them. Now, this is framed probably is quite a leading question, but please feel free to disagree with me. How important has just sticking with your guns been to, you know, sticking with this business? How important has, has that been to getting to the point where I believe that things are looking pretty, pretty good for you at the moment and, re and the rest of the team? It's foundationally important. Basically everything I do uh, in business and in personal life these days is a long-term play. On one side, yes, it's hard to stick to something, especially because it's ups and downs and they're downs and you're like, oh, is it just not working? But you have to trust the process a little bit of figuring things out and such. The business, the marketing, I don't know, my, my own personal fitness journey, like weightlifting, uh, weight loss, whatever not. All these things are just so gradual uh, that you will never see uh, the ROI in like a week or two. Like you, you just cannot. But you will see the ROI within next month, within a few months or a few years. So uh, that kind of shifts the focus from like short-term decisions towards long-term decisions a lot. Yeah. And the whole startup game is about patience. Like, come on. It's just uh, seriously just about uh, sticking... Uh, with it. And uh, you never know what's across the corner, as one of the fellow founders, uh, Sofia Quintero says, uh, just stick to it. Because sure, there will be some luck situations. But again, like maybe an influencer will adopt your tool and suddenly something like will snap and you have an overnight <laughs> success <laughs> or something like that. Or maybe an industry trend uh, comes along or a pandemic or you know what uh, can happen. Um, and suddenly you will be writing a new wave that uh, like amplifies your MRR. But beneath that is a very slow and steady uh, game of like uh, tedious month to month growth, which is hard work and things like that. Mm, the not so glamorous side of building a, no a glamorous business. at all no mm. <laughs> the mm. upside though is that when you are in the long term business, there are no day to day things that you must do by midnight that will move the needle. And that's great. You don't have the stress of those consulting deadlines. We've had brought the bit of those st that stress with the done for you services, like I mentioned, because that basically puts us in consulting shoes a little bit. So that's added. But beyond that, there is no like consulting deadlines and you're just working towards uh, those goals. Having a team and having a co-founder and processes does help a lot with uh, being accountable and having that flywheel of processes instead of just having to come up with something every day. So that helps. Now, you, you're obviously someone who's been a designer, a consulting designer. So you've got a very strong affinity for design. And clearly through the podcasting that you're still doing, you're very much in that headspace. But you've also developed other aspects of who you are you know you're now a founder and you're now involved in the broader scope of activities that are required uh, to make a product business work which is different to your consulting business now I've heard you talk about some realizations that you've come to as a result of that mm, evolution I don't know if it's an evolution it's more of a an adding an and an anding to your professional toolkit and you've said and I'll quote you now 
The most important thing is understanding your place in the world as a UX designer. On one hand, of course, great UX is essential to software success. On the other hand, it's such a minuscule part of all the processes and limited resource game that's going on in the SaaS and software world in general. So that, to me, is quite a, sounds like quite a confronting realisation. When did you first start to believe that? And was that an easy thing to realise? Well, the fact that UX in general is a small part in terms of volume of work that is done on a startup, that was a well-known fact, uh, had been for a while. But it wasn't until we had our own startup journey unraveling that we understood that design is like a really really not not the crucial part of it even though like i wouldn't say if we if we had poor design we wouldn't be where we are today so it's still mandatory to have a nice design like these days especially for email platforms like you don't go anywhere with bad design in my old days as a consultant and i quit me and Benedict, we quit consulting in 2020. So the last three years we've been um, full, full-time founders. My favorite clients were those who were able to achieve good business growth uh, in spite of very bad design. So they had an audience, they had a working product, and they only needed that uh, improvement to make it even better. That's like the goldmine for a consultant. And having worked with a number of such products... It's really sobering, like even back then, that you can see uh, they're solving a pain big enough uh, and uh, doing it smart enough uh, so that design is not not a mandatory thing to be successful. Therefore, it's a bit depressing uh, from from the perspective of a, de- or could be a bit depressing from the perspective <laughs> of a designer. It's, it almost calls into question if the pain is big enough and it's been solved with bad design, then what is the r- role of good design? It's still super important because it, uh, well, it makes the life of the user pleasant. That's that's one. And, and it communicates quality because poor design communicates poor quality. And sure, they're making it work without good design, which means if they multiply it by good quality perception and and pleasant user experience, they could achieve even better results there. So uh, it's just a great validation for their own business that design is not a prerequisite. And honestly, the first years of any startup is cutting corners whenever you can so that you can uh, get it up and running, solving an actual business problem. And for those uh, for those businesses, design just was not, they just easily cut corners there and it was fine. So also there are so many design resources these days, uh, libraries, of components, whatever or not, there's amazing Tailwind CSS, for example, and anything that you can get things up and running in a pretty way without even having a talk with a designer or maybe having a, like, I think the best way is to have a conversation with your design friend, have a lo- nice logo design, just to make sure you're not committing a crime there. And then uh, going with some libraries and they that can easily take you as a founder through the first few years until you have uh, time and resources to invest into design work. Mm. When you are thinking of your use of the word design there, are you including UX research within that or are you speaking specifically to the more visual aspects of a product's design? Also, UX research can take different shapes, as you well know. So specifically testing like different UI components, that's a very high fidelity advanced game that only um, funded startups or startups with a lot of resources can afford to do. But customer conversations are also a form of UX research. So that kind of thing uh, you cannot skip on. And those startups who have poor design, which like the product looks horrible, Still doesn't mean that it works horrible. Uh, maybe they have nailed a couple of functions to work really well that actually solve the problem. UX is kind of a dime a dozen. Like on one side, yes, great UX is hard to nail. On the other side, everybody who is uh, who has good like eyesight for quality products, who has good experience as a user, can come up with successful patterns that satisfy their business need. So it's not like it's rocket science. Uh, so that combined with good customer com- customer conversations, jobs to be done stuff, customer development, that can lead to good results. And every founder can do that so they can replace uh, their lack of professional UX jobs with uh, just good investment into customer uh, conversations. 
it's a bit of a convoluted answer, but uh, yeah, like that kind of product work is definitely happening in startups, even with no money. That's a really curious answer. And why I say curious is I'm just wondering about the framing of the answer for my own purposes and for the people listening. <laughs> it's because it sounds like you're saying that there's not a huge role for designers and at least not initially when money is tight. And I was wondering if the the same thinking applies to how you see design in later stage companies or perhaps uh, enterprise businesses. I'm not sure what your exposure has been uh, with with those um, businesses, but does the same framing apply outside of the world of early stage bootstrap SaaS? I don't think it directly correlates with the stage of growth, even though it's it's resourceful. I don't specifically say there is no place for design because it does depend on the on the founder so much. Like there can be a founder of a two day startup who is saying like, oh, we're not launching without good design. This is a must have. And they're right. Like it's it's definitely a great success factor. Or they're like, oh, we're not investing uh, in design until like we're five years in. And they're also right because there is uh, there is more important stuff to do. And same for uh, advanced startups, uh, not startups, even like mature products and and especially enterprise. I'm not big into enterprise game, but also there are enterprise products that are nice looking, and there are enterprise products that are completely unusable. All of them are making money, and it depends on the product leader or whether the leadership team is thinking about design much or whether it's not. Of course, at a certain point, every business is kind of forced to think about design because they're hopefully evaluating, uh, you know, their business and like looking for areas to improve. And that's when they will stumble across very poor product design. But unless it's causing like specific uh, support issues, the, the, the bar of quality differs dramatically from business to business. And these days, Web design is great to get, so you will be seeing plenty of pretty product websites and thinking, oh, it's it's pretty from the outside, must have a great product inside with the same kind of design edge. But no, it's very common to to see something not very pleasant inside, even if the marketing website is looking pretty. And I don't want to call names, but even like the big, uh, big, big incumbents in the space, if you open up their UI you'll be unpleasantly surprised by like how unintuitive it is. And they're like at the Salesforce level of like being, uh, being huge. I've heard you talk about that before and, and I'll quote you again. You've said for a software product, a well-designed marketing website is 1000 times more important than what's inside the product. Yes. And it's pretty sad <laughs> because the product itself matters. So that is sad. I, I agree. And you've just touched on all the reasons. Uh, I want to add a, couple of cents from my very, very historic work. Um, yeah, sure. In the old days, we were developing software products. We called them digital encyclopedias or like digital info products on CDs back when then what a thing that was a thing. I spent a few years of my life designing CD covers because they would put the most, the best designer on the cover because it matters the most, basically. That square piece of paper I don't know, like five inches by five inches. It's more important than anything that goes inside because the, the buyer buys the CD. They only can see the, the, the front and the back and that's all. Unfortunately, that's the same. Sure, uh, with software, you can get demos and stuff, but uh, it's still the, the CD cover that matters. <sighs> It's almost a, a bit of an indictment on modern business practice because it's, it's, what it's bringing up for me is it's almost like that whole lipstick on a pig saying that we're, we're dressing up our software through our marketing websites when we know that what the user will experience once the buyer, if we're talking about B2B here, has purchased it is going to be disappointing in comparison to what we conveyed when we were marketing that solution, our product to them. The users are not dumb. Like we should mm. not underestimate them. They will tell a good product from a bad product. But if the marketing website is bad, you, they will not even have a chance of checking out your product and seeing whether it's good or not. 
So that's why so, you say it's a thousand uh, times more yes, important. Yes, that's like it's it's the top of your product funnel, and you cannot mm-hmm. go with that being bad. And a marketing website is much easier to design and implement. By the way, we've talked great lot of great deal of time about design itself, but implementing a good UI. It's a lot of time and resources polishing go to good UI. Uh, even if you have like your layouts in Figma perfectly fine, making that happen is a lot of engineering time. Polishing that is even more engineering time. And like that gap is also huge. And uh, that's one thing that frustrated me a lot in my consulting days because I would deliver Figma files as a, as a deliverable. And then I had no control. Only a fraction of my clients would go further uh, into polishing stage with me, but there is so much to polish always. And it's like going back and forth on very minor details saying like, oh, that should be three pixels more. It's a necessary stage if you want to look polished, but, uh, only a fraction of teams understand that. So design itself, it's not enough, uh, execution and polishing and maintaining and then much more is also important. Even on the visual level, even on the visual level, not speaking about UX either. Yeah, and finding those partners in engineering, particularly in the front end of engineering, who are just as invested in positioning the design by the pixel to convey the intent that was existing in that file is also those uh, engineers are, in my experience, they've been relatively rare. Mm. I think uh, there is great power in designers who can front and code. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time in my lifetime to, to, to learn that. Like <laughs> if I had another year on the side, somehow I would love to be able to bring like my ideas to life myself. Well, Jane, you're only about halfway through your career, so uh, there's still time. Okay. <laughs> Uh, definitely. So I'm a designer. I'm definitely a marketer these days. Maybe uh, I will become an engineer when I'm 60 or so. But let's see. <laughs> let's see. Let's it's see. an interesting learning journey. Yes. Hey, let's change things up a little and touch on when you became a solo consultant. Uh, so rewind in your mind there. And also subsequently as a founder, which you currently are, you've had to navigate the realities of paying yourself your own paycheck through various things that you've done. And about this, you've said, and I'll quote you again, designers often think that if they have a nifty black and white page with some of their works, that that's going to sell their services or that the UI is going to sell itself. No, you have to write about it as much as you have to design it. So what made you realize the importance of writing and how it would influence people's decision to work with you or to adopt your product? Well, that, that is a fun story how it all began. When I just put up the first version of UI Breakfast website with the first consulting gigs on it, I showed it to my uh, very loyal uh, client for, that I met through Upwork and Ian Dooley from Australia very grateful to him. And he said, Jane, your, your copy is bad. I'm like, why? Like there are no grammar mistakes. It's probably, it's probably fine. He's like, no, like it, the copy is bad. Go to uh, copyhackers.com and buy all Joanna Weep's books and read them all. You're going to be much better off. That basically was an introduction to all the marketing uh, slash copywriting that you can see on the marketing websites and sales pages everywhere. It's so essential copyhackers.com is a great resource. There's also like a thousand other great resources on writing that teach you to tap into users' pains and um, how to write and, and, and things like that. And, and it's all about writing. It's all about selling your services. And then in the process of delivering your services, you again have to use language to describe your decisions and to, to sell those. As you move into software and products, it's particularly crucial. And the only ways to, to, to master that is to practice through writing articles, writing your own sales pages. Unfortunately, images, sure, they do sell themselves in a, in a certain extent. If you want to be like a pair of working hands that is like bought, uh, that is selling their time, uh, when somebody browses your portfolio during your job application process, sure, your good portfolio will, will, will be valuable. But if you want to go solo and, and go beyond the visual eye candy, then you have to sell through sales pages and understand the business value of your work and sell it with words. And copy absolutely trumps design on marketing websites. So a well-designed marketing website is important, but if it has poor copy, it has nowhere to go. So like a poorly designed site with good copy, 
is much better than a well-designed website with like placeholder stuff. Well, let's talk about something else that you've come to realize. And that is if we zoom out from our day-to-day activities and we consider the broader picture of what it is that we're contributing our talents to, whether we're researchers or designers or product managers, you've said the foundational idea that people need to know about products is why do products actually exist? But it's definitely not baked into the design profession, unfortunately. So why do the products we're working on exist? And Mm -hmm. why is it important for us to know that? It's kind of a very very old and vague thing I said. <laughs> I'm, not sure right. what I, what, I'm not sure what I had in mind when I was saying that. But products exist because they are solving a problem for the customers and the customers are willing to pay money for it repeatedly. And they also exist because the founders are able to draw people's eyeballs through marketing to that solution. That what I would add to that these days, <laughs> like because that businesses do not exist without a marketing engine. That understanding that all definitely helps uh, for, for the business context. Yeah, and that business context, you know, this is uh, what many design leaders, particularly the ones that I've spoken to on the podcast here, and I know the ones that are listening to will agree that understanding that business context is really important, in particular what you've touched on there in so far as how the business makes money. You know, how does it actually pay us the salaries that we're being paid? And you've actually taken that a step further and you've previously said learn how the business that you serve makes money and learn what part of that money belongs to your sphere of expertise. So what is it about understanding which part belongs to our sphere of expertise as designers that you feel is important in the context of design and business? I love it that you're bringing up like uh, those old quotes one by one. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm uh, thinking that way these days. Well, Uh, if you want to reframe, please go ahead. But it's a great, but it's a great, like understanding how they make money. Yes, you can leverage that to anchor your design decisions. That would be a correct word. Uh, these days, I think that design plays even smaller role, and I don't think that any particular uh, money goes into design at all. It's just the foundational layer of quality that belongs to a product, and we are craftsmen that are responsible for that layer. It kind of spans out through, throughout the business from uh, the blog design to the marketing, sales page design to the product design. It's all foundational and uh, it's necessary, makes for a great experience, but it doesn't make money on its own unless it's married to a useful product, useful copy, and marketing effort, marketing resources pumped into that. So it sounds like what you're saying is that you don't see design as a, a strategic value driver or value creator. Uh, that's not necessarily so, especially, for example, user list. It's, it's yet another email service provider. There is a thousand out there. Uh, the way we're successful is by focusing on a certain narrow audience, SaaS companies, and designing the product in a way that makes a very complex job, email automation, seem, feel easier in their day-to-day experience than it really is. So design is, in fact, our important differentiator. But we can't say that like good design is our, uh, that's why you should buy user list. But in fact, it kind of is, uh, but it's not going to sell user list on its own just by saying that we have good design. It's, it's, it's just something that has to be there. If we got it right, that's great. Uh, but it's not going to sell the problem. Is creating an experience that taps into or delivers a solution to a burning need or a problem in a business context that a company or a in, in jobs language, a job performer, for example, has, is that design or is that something else? I think we should spend less time making labels for things and more time doing things. And then uh, you might not need the labels at all or the labels might emerge organically. I would say that. Like, why would we spend time defining the boundaries of design. Like everything is designed. Product design in a very wide sense is meeting the needs of the audience, starting from understa- finding the audience, understanding the audience, designing the product for the audience, making it visually pleasing. It's all design. It's all important. But yeah, it's it's not as easy as it sounds because when when you start implementing that, 
you find that you only have that much time and that much money to make things happen. That's when the interesting things start. Like as a consumer, you might be looking at like, oh, Dropbox is a huge company. Why don't they make this page prettier? Like how can they, like how can it even happen in big companies? Like, well, no, Dropbox is also struggling with limited resources. Yes, they have a lot of resources, but it's never enough. I've interviewed many folks at very established companies and they're like, yes, we can never do what we want. Uh, fast enough, uh, it's never enough resources to make what we want happen. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you're talking about the emphasis sh should be on how do we create value and less about the label or the way that we identify, <laughs> yeah. especially uh, in yeah. the context of a, of, of a SaaS business that is, you know, not, you know, funded by a venture capital with, you know, heaps of cash to burn, for example. Yeah. Like, uh, it's it's kind of enjoyable to speculate, but like, what practical difference does it make what we label design and what we make don't label design? Like, this stuff needs to happen uh, for the product to exist. Like, wireframes, <laughs> you know, the visual design, uh, front end code, and then back end code. These are like the jobs to be done for us as craftsmen. And let's, let's go make that happen. Well, Jane, you've certainly done a lot of interesting and challenging things in your career. You've been an agency creative director, a solo consultant, and you've been a two-time founder. And also you're a podcast host of UI Breakfast and Better Done uh, Than Perfect. And all of this is in a career, as I mentioned earlier, that isn't even halfway through. So of all the things that you've done, what is the one that you're most proud of and why? Uh, the one that you didn't mention is being a mom of three kids. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of that because honestly, it's it's another part of me that we don't talk much about online, but it's it's a big part of, of my life. I guess uh, w w what I'm most proud of is it's the journey itself, being able to make progress over the years and being able to enjoy, to do things that you enjoy, primarily those for a living, uh, working, being able to, I don't think that work-life balance really exists, but being able to manage all of that in the, and, and staying sane and relatively happy, that's a great accomplishment in my books. I think through leveraging my career, and then being able to buy parts of my time as a mom and as a business owner. Because, of course, there is no way to run a business, two podcast shows, and have three kids and do it all yourself. It's, it's just incredibly impossible. So I can buy parts of my time here and there, leverage our awesome team, leverage our another awesome team on the family side to make things happen. Yeah, it's a team effort. Like, it, it takes a lot of it takes a village to raise kids <laughs> and, and this way kind of, uh, can hack the system, be happy female and also be uh, successful in business. I think it's a miracle to be honest. I don't talk much about like feminism and such. I do have opinions. I just don't want to like, I don't want to be known for, for that. I'd rather be known for general business things, but uh, being able to balance it all out is, is pretty amazing. That's what I'm happy about. Mm, that's certainly an inspiring story. And this has been a really refreshing <laughs> conversation about your Thank story, you. about the challenges you faced along the way, both as a designer and also as a founder. So thank you for so generously sharing your stories and insights with me today. Thank you, Brenda. It's been a pleasure to dive into those. Oh, it's been a pleasure for me as well. And Jane, if people want to connect with you or keep up to date with all the wonderful things that you're doing, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, my personal website is uibreakfast.com. That's where uh, the UI Breakfast podcast lives at. I'm also UI Breakfast on Twitter and LinkedIn. And userless.com is where most of my work goes to these days. We have a spectacular blog with nice illustrations and great articles. Check them out. Thanks, Jane. I'll make sure that I put a link to all of those things in the show notes. And to everyone that's been tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. As I mentioned, everything will be in the show notes, including where you can find Jane, UI Breakfast and User List. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX research, product management and design, don't forget to leave a review on the podcast. Those are really helpful. Subscribe and also just share it with one other person who you feel would get value out of these conversations. 
conversations at depth. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search for Brendan Jarvis, or there's a link to my LinkedIn profile at the bottom of the show notes. Lastly, you could visit our website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz. That's thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave.